packet, and today I'll be presenting to you a research paper I produced throughout the semester of a Race in American Literature course in the fall of 2021 as a part of the English undergraduate department. Before we begin, I'd like to provide you with a little bit of background information regarding the subjects of this project. Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were born into slavery in the mid-1700s. They met in Delaware, where they both joined the Methodist Church. Allen was allowed to buy freedom through his religious outreach in 1783, when both he and his master converted to Christianity, whilst Jones purchased his freedom in 1784. The two men met again in Philadelphia, where they acquired wealth and joined St. George's Methodist Church. During a Sunday prayer service in 1787, Jones and Allen, as well as other black congregation members, were forcibly removed from the gallery where they knelt. Knowing they could build something better for themselves and for their community, Jones and Allen left the church and founded the Free African Society which later became the St. Thomas Episcopal Church of Philadelphia. During the yellow fever epidemic of 1793, Dr. Benjamin Rush entreated Jones and Allen to aid the sick, though they were later vilified by writers like Matthew Carey, who published a pamphlet incorrectly characterizing the African-American community as taking advantage of the poor and sick during the epidemic thus facilitating a need for a response from Jones and Allen, who used this opportunity to start creating a written record, a collective voice, for their community. This leads us to my research, which I've titled Creating a Black Collective, Represent Representation Through Print, in a Narrative of the Proceedings of the Black People During the Late Awful Calamity in Philadelphia. Print has the ability to shift or even entirely create a narrative. In the United States, Fact has often been informed by a very white, very biased voice, whether that be in times of war, internal calamities, or anything else in between. This inevitably results in issues of misrepresentation, factual inaccuracies, and simple dominance by majoritarian rule. The public response to the Philadelphia Yellow Fever epidemic of 1793, particularly the white public through the medium of print, is no stranger to these issues. The event has notes of racist rhetoric, scientific inaccuracies, and general anti-black sentiment threaded throughout the literature of the time. During the height of pamphleteering wars, and this time in the 18th century, with pamphlets flying from printers to eager hands, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones seized an opportunity to join a predominantly white sect of writers, appointing themselves as spokespersons for issues of race that extend far outside of the confines of Philadelphia, to slavery at large, while uniquely positioning their argument for a very specific Philadelphian audience. In their jointly authored 1794 work titled, A Narrative of the Proceedings of the Black People During the Late Awful Calamity in Philadelphia, Richard Allen, and Absalom Jones seek to rene renegotiate the way in which African Americans have been represented in print, capitalizing upon the popularity of pamphleteering in the 18th century to rewrite white narratives and create a collective voice for the black community. Scholarship from Jacqueline Bacon, Mariola Espinoza, Philip Gold, and Jacqueline C. Miller contextualizes Jones and Allen in terms of how they act in this moment in time and why it's it successful given the social and economic status of Philadelphia in the 1790s, particularly regarding public opinion on African Americans. Scholarship from Anne C. Lammers, Richard S. Newman, and Thomas E. Will engage with Allen, Allen and Jones's pamphlet through the broader implications of how Jones and Allen participate in the African American community and center themselves as central voices. In conjunction with this scholarship, this paper seeks to identify how Jones and Allen use the popularity of pamphleteering in order to establish a black collective within and beyond Philadelphia's yellow fever crisis. Allen and Jones primarily center their argument in a response to fellow pamphlet writer Matthew Carey and those who felt similarly to him, on the issue of partial representation found within print in reference to the African-American community. Carey's work, A Short Account of the Malignant Fever, is not the first work of its kind to diminish the African-American community, but it is significant in that it is what Jones and Allen use as a means of capitalizing upon this moment in pamphleteering history. In the opening lines of the Jones and Allen's pamphlet, they write, quote, In consequence of a particular partial representation of the conduct of the people who were employed to nurse the sick, we are solicited to step forward and declare the facts as they really were. 
end quote. This opening statement serves a dual purpose. One, to immediately set forth the idea that there has been grievous injustices done against the African-American community that is resulting in a need for immediate concern in the form of printed rebuttal, and two, to emphasize just how wide the reach of a single piece of literature is. Jacqueline C. Miller notes that, quote, Matthew Carey publicly charged African-Americans with extortion. Many other white Philadelphians were privately even more critical of African-American workers, end quote. Carey is first mentioned in the opening paragraph of the pamphlet where Jones and Allen quote from his pamphlet and then contradict his remarks on who exactly aided in efforts to combat the fever. Quote, Here it, it ought to be remarked that Ms. Mr. Carey hath not done it, but two-thirds of the persons who rendered these essential services were people of color. End quote. Carey then becomes the platform through which a white narrative is built. That is not to say that he is singularly responsible for its creation, but his public critiques provide a conduit through which racially charged prejudice can be funneled. In other words, one man's words, put in print, have the ability to impact an entire marginalized community and continue to perpetuate a series of falsities and half-truths or partial representation outside of the community or event for which it was intendedly intended originally intended to reach. This, in turn, creates a specific tension that Jones and Allen expound upon, conveying a sense of urgency, quote, We have found reports spread of our taking between one and two hundred beds from houses when people, where people died. Such slanderers as these who propagate such willful lies are dangerous, end quote. Circulated falsehoods have the ability to take on the illusion of truth and become wedged in the corners of the memory, into words spoken from mouth to mouth, to clippings pressed into the pages of journals, and thus creates an immediate need for response. Jones and Allen indirectly allude to how print aimed at misrepresenting the African-American community might perpetuate further harm, speaking more abstractly at several points, quote, we wish not to offend, but when an unprovoked attempt is made to make us blacker than we are, it becomes less necessary to be overcautious on that account. End quote. This scene might not necessarily arrest our attention in the context of the role of print, but it is integral to understanding the wider impact of false or distorted narratives in print. Or, in other words, African Americans being metaphorically painted blacker is a direct result of Prince's role as a spreader of misinformation relating to the black community. The fact that Jones and Allen published their own rebuttal to the various and assorted sources of prejudice in print form, rather than through public speech or the like, is significant as well. The impact of print is substantial, and its fiscal form maintains its own authority that lends it both credibility and durability. Jones and Allen go a step further specifically noting how much damage can be done in such little print space. Quote, We feel ourselves hurt most by a partial censorious paragraph where he asperses the blacks alone for having to take, taken the advantage of the distressed situation of the people. End quote. Carey makes this claim in, as Jones and Allen referred to it, a single paragraph, and yet it is the thing which appears to strike them as the most egregious insult to their community. The pamphlets like Carey's and even Jones and Allen's are intended to be a sort of ephemeral print, meaning they are not meant to last and find a permanent place in the literary canon, the implications of Jones and Allen's response is clear. The promotion of racial prejudice in white narratives through print is not something that simply disappears into the folds of history and thus requires the creation of a collective voice to combat it. Furthermore, a pamphlet in its material form is not made for longevity. Pamphlets are, were historically produced cheaply and quickly. The very fact that the pamphlet, pamphlet published by Allen and Jones survives into the 21st century is evidence to their point in and of itself. Literature intended to be ephemeral is not always destined to be so. Jones and Allen, in capitalizing upon this moment during the epidemic to establish a collective voice for the African American community, are grappling with a great number of obstacles in making this happen. Jacqueline Bacon explains one part of this tension as that they, quote, must assume agency as individuals specifically empowered to persuade. At the same time, to argue on behalf of African Americans in general, they must create a voice that stresses their membership in a community and de-emphasizes their personal claims to authority. End quote. 
To accomplish this, Jones and Allen place a specific emphasis on the pronoun we at several points of the pamphlet in reference to how they themselves blend with the hurt felt by their community. Quote, at some future day, when some of the most virtuous may fall into the service of a family that are stranger to him or her, and it is discovered that it is one of the stigmatized wretches, what may we, what may we suppose will be the consequence? End quote. They are not referring to themselves singularly in this moment, but rather the echo of fear and worry of the collective. This is significant in that Jones and Allen are intentionally using this space and the opportunities given to them to work to mitigate the damage done by misrepresentation or partial representation in both Carrie's pamphlet and other rumblings of the period. They have already established their credibility in the forming of the Free African Society, and as Anne C. Lammers notes, quote, significantly, there are only two names on the preamble of the Free African Society, Jones and Allen, end quote. This is important to mention in that it highlights how the two are principal figures in Philadelphian society and thus in a position where they can use that in order to capitalize upon the moment at hand. It should also be noted that Carrie's pamphlet went through multiple editions and printings, running as almost something akin to a newspaper. This allowed for the circulation of false information and for stereotypes to be pushed several times over. Jones and Allen stressed, too, how important that it is to note that a white writer like Carey has been afforded this space and time to print multiple editions of his writings. Quote, Mr. Carey's first, second, and third editions are gone forth into the world and in all probability has been read by thousands that will never read his fourth. End quote. Carey and many other white writers like him are essentially establishing their own collectives for their work, and by highlighting this, Jones and Allen further emphasize how necessary it is for the African-American community to have their own version of a collective as well, and reaffirms their use of the pronoun we, even outside of their own selves. Some might argue that Carey himself mitigates the damage his multiple editions of his pamphlets and flicks by employing the not-all-African-Americans argument offering a backhanded compliment to Jones and Allen, but his singling out of specific people as the good ones, like Jones and Allen, actually supports their claims for a need for a black collective. Jones and Allen write, quote, By naming us, he leaves these others in the hazardous state of being classed with those who are called the vilest, end quote. As Jones and Allen explain it, Carrie is leaving the door open for further perpetuation of racist prejudice against African Americans and putting forth the idea that only a handful of the community are good and helpful to the cause, and the rest are taking advantage of the horrific state of Philadelphia during the epidemic. This thinking, then, does not stay within the confines of Philadelphia, instead adding to the already existing layers upon layers of racism built into the foundation of the United States. Thomas E. Will notes that, quote, The ministers made it clear that they identify closely with lower-class African Americans. To those who would argue that poverty exempted one from disinterestedness and independent thought and thus from citizenship, Allen answered that duty to God bound all individuals to society more closely than property ever could, end quote. Allen and Jones centered themselves directly within the community, and in the idea of being bound together, thus contradicting the arguments made by Carey and other white writers of the period that there are a handful of good African Americans, singular, aiding in the crisis efforts. They also go a step further in stressing how free African Americans continue to be impacted by misrepresentation and racial prejudice through the epidemic. Arguments made by Carey and the like also tend to ignore the fact that African American lives were lost as a result of the epidemic, something Allen and Jones refute with quantitative evidence. Quote, in 1792, there were 67 of our color buried, and in 1793, it amounted to 305. Thus, the burials among us have increased more than fourfold. Was not this in a great degree to the effects of the services of the unjustly vilified black people? End quote. Here, they again use a plural pronoun, our, to indicate their inclusion in the group of vili vilified people, therefore negating Carrie's attempt at appeasement of black mistreatment. In other words, it is imperative for Jones and Allen to situate themselves as part of the whole, rather than singularly, as Carrie wishes them to be, to combat how the white narratives have attempted to stifle the creation of a black collective. In creating a black collective during this particular time, Allen and Jones would be remiss not to address the ongoing issue of slavery, something they acknowledge and draw attention to in the closing pamphlet, 
in a section titled, quote, an address to those who kept, keep slaves and uphold the practice, end quote. In this, they plead for an understanding from the white community, addressing Christian values and invoking biblical context, quote, we do not wish to make you angry, but excite your attention to consider how hateful slavery is in the sight of that God who hath destroyed kings and princes for their oppression of the poor slaves, end quote. Some might view this address of the issue of slavery out of place in the context of the pamphlet, which as a whole is meant to combat harmful white narratives surrounding the yellow fever epidemic, but in actuality, yellow fever itself is instrumental to the conversation surrounding slavery. Mariola Espinoza writes, quote, Historians argue that the widespread adoption of slavery to meet the labor needs of the British sugar-producing colonies of the Caribbean was the product of blacks' innate immunity to yellow fever, end quote. So, rather than being out of place within the pamphlet, it can instead be argued that the pamphlet couldn't exist without acknowledging the relationship between the fever and slavery. The implication that the slave trade was in fact bolstered by how the fever was perceived makes it incredibly relevant for Jones and Allen to emphasize. Philadelphia specifically becomes a part of the conversation then, due to the city's proximity to port hubs and its role as a trading point. The slavery was slowly transitioning out of the state, Slaves were a central part of how the city functioned prior to the Gradual Abolition Act of 1780. To not acknowledge slavery and its relevance to the city of Philadelphia would be to totally ignore an integral piece of African American history, something Jones and Allen did not intend to do in their creation of a black collective. Discussing slavery in the pamphlet is also a rather clever means of capitalizing upon what is, in every meaning of the cl cliché, writing in the right place at the right time. In discussing Jones and Allen's pamphlet in the context of where and when it was written, Philip Gold writes, quote, As the scene of such an exchange, Philadelphia was, after all, the wealthiest American city in the second half of the 18th century, the nation's center of domestic and international trade, end quote. In short, a lot of eyes were on Philadelphia in this time period, monitoring its response to the epidemic being so vital to the United States economy, so in spite of the fact that it was transitioning into a free state, the attention afforded to the epidemic in Philadelphia itself makes it a pertinent point for establishing a black collective voice. Richard S. Newman notes that the simultaneous rise in black print and black imagery in this period and its role in emancipation efforts, quote, African Americans wrote roughly 1,500 documents between 1760 and 1829. African American portraiture of the early 19th century certainly indicated the rising significance of texts in the project of black emancipation. End quote. For instance, in one portrait, Richard Allen is drawn, drawing attention to a Bible in his lap, and Absalom Jones is showing doing sim similarly in another piece. At a surface level, it might not seem like it connects back to the work that Jones and Allen are doing, but when viewing the context of their writings on slavery, the connection is immediately apparent. Quote, We believe if you would try the experiment of taking a few black children and cultivate their minds with the same care and let them have the same prospect and view as you would wish for your own children, you would find them upon the trial they were not inferior in mental endowments. End quote. The concept of portraits in the Jones and Allen section of the pamphlet addressing slavery speaks to the large role Jones and Allen have in the community, as well as how they are taking advantage of their moment. The emphasis they place on the biblical wrongness of slavery serves as yet another means of contradicting claims of Carrie and the like that paint the African American community negatively. Essentially, they are arguing that upholding of institutions of prejudice, of perpetuating a moral wrong, almost negates the points Carrie makes because of how the narrative has been structured. Black children have the same abilities as white children, as Jones and Allen argue, but a white narrative has altered that perception. Without the racial prejudice perpetuated in white narratives, without the institutions of slavery, blacks would have the same opportunities as whites. Thus, the creation of a black collective is an attempt to dismantle the system already in place. As Jones and Allen highlight the partial representation in Carey's writing, the space afforded to him and other white writers, and ultimately how the narrative regarding the yellow fever epidemic has been seriously skewed due to these things. Absalom Jones and Richard Allen are writing about a very specific historic event in a limited form of print during a time in which the voices of African-American writers in the United States are often overlooked, if not totally stifled. 
Though the work and content of their pamphlet might seem limited in its reach, it speaks to much larger issues that African Americans around the country grappled with in the 18th century. Misrepresentation in print and the ongoing crimes of slavery included. In short, they address the lack of a black collective, a physical representation of black tr struggle both within slavery and outside of it, and the role that white narratives have in shaping the hierarchies of the period. By doing so, they weave the voices of their community into the threads of a predominantly white history. Jones and Allen capitalize upon the popularity of the 17th century pamphleteering era, intentionally appointing themselves as spokespeople of the African-American community and creators of a black collective. Thank you.